So friends, for today, if you'd like to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm going to tell the story, and you can read along as we go, and there may be a spot or two where I ask you to, to read a verse so you stick with me, right? So stick with me because that's what we're going to do. We've been going through a sermon series for the month of January and now into February is listening to the Lord whatever. Listening to the Lord's wisdom, listening to the Lord's direction, listening to the Lord's plan. And today it's listening to the Lord's plan and purposes. And the question through all of these have been, are you aligned with him? Are you with him? Are you one of the wise men? Are you still seeking him? Are you finding him and are you following his direction for our lives? The story today is about a whole bunch of people, and, and Bill didn't read the whole story from chapter 5. I'm going to go a little bit further, and then I'm going to introduce you to a man who listened to the Lord, and we're going to see what happens when you do listen to the Lord. For God does not send you to places where he's not already planned for you to go. And every place that you go, you have to be looking for, what is God going to use me for here? Here's the story. There's a man who is a general, one of the Arameans. He's from Aram. His name is Naaman. And it says, uh, now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. And why? Read it with me. Because through him... The Lord had given victory to Aaron. Now, I want you to know this is a man who didn't know God. A man, however, who was used by God for God's purposes. And he's bringing him along in life to just the right moment when he can be used and where his faith is remembered in our scripture. Now, the problem with Naaman is he had leprosy. Leprosy wasn't anything that anybody could heal. Certainly, he had tried every way he could to make sure that, that he had the best medical care and attention, but nothing seemed to work. And then something happened. A little voice. And it wasn't a voice from God. It wasn't a voice from the angels, like coming to Mary or Joseph. It's the voice of a little girl. How did that little girl get so much power over Naaman? Well, it's simple. Uh, verse 2. Now, bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, mistress what did she say, verse 3? If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. A little girl ripped out of her village. A little girl ripped out of her family. A little girl made into a slave and still seeking what God would have her do. In fact, she trusted in God so much that she looked at, him, at Naaman's hopeless situation and said, I've got hope. Let me tell you about the hope I have. All you have to do is go find yourself in Israel. Elisha will take care of you. God will watch over you because he's oh so powerful and he will show himself. Our God loves to show up in big ways and small ways, but big ways too. The small way is the little voice of the little girl. The big way is what happens next. Naaman takes all of this wealth, takes shekels of, uh, talents of silver and shekels of gold and, and a whole bunch of sets of clothing. And he sets off. And the first place he goes to is somebody who is not aligned with God. He goes to the king of Israel with a letter saying, here is what I do. I want you to make sure I get healed. And the king of Israel tears his clothes. He says, what? They're trying to pick, pick on me. They're, they're trying to, 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 to pick a fight with me. I can't bring him healing. What is this action? The little voice of the little girl was much more faithful than that of the king of Israel. And that teaches us. Teaches us that power and strength and might are nothing unless it's aligned with the word of God Naaman goes and finds Elisha or starts that way and Elisha doesn't even want to see him he sends a servant and says listen you go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River 
and Naaman gets mad. He says, wait a minute, you're not even going to see me. I thought you could do some hocus pocus over me. I thought I'd be able to pay you something. And all you're saying is go down and wash seven times in the river. I got better rivers back home. And he's mad and he's leaving. And the servants say to him, Father, Naaman, if he had told you to climb up Mount McKinley, would you have gone? If he told you to walk across the, 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 the uh, Mojave Desert, would you have gone? He's just telling you to go take a couple of dips in the Jordan River. Why don't you listen to him? And he did. And he's healed. Friends, how many of us are still struggling in life because we just won't listen? Because we've got a better idea than God's idea. We've got a better plan than God's plan. We've got better direction than his direction. We've got a, 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 we've got a better philosophy, a, a better theology. We've, we've got, we've got our own direction and our own authority. And friends, that all means nothing unless you are aligned with the will and the direction of God and his plan. Naaman, Naaman responded. And you see, see what happens when you align yourself and let God do his thing? Read verse, verse uh, 15, uh, it, down at the bottom of the right-hand side of the page. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Now, Elisha knew that wasn't God's plan. And so he didn't accept it. And Naaman then says, okay, if you're not going to accept my gift, then let me take a couple of a bucketfuls of dirt back with me so that this land, this God of this land, wherever I am, I want some of him to be with me. And then he asked, please, also, can, can I ask one more favor of you? I've got some jobs to do. I, I'm the, the leader of the army. And one of my jobs as the leader of the army is to stand and help the king. When he bows down to this other god, Rimnon, I got to bow down too because, because I got to help him get down on his knees and help him back up. Please don't hold that against me. It's not I'm saying this is another God, but just don't hold that against me. And Elisha said, of course not. I know where your faith is. Friends in Christ, when God acts in somebody's life, things change. And I want to introduce you to a man who has been hearing God's word of direction and has been speaking God's word of direction and has been translating God's word of direction to people who, who have languages that are verbal languages. They, they don't have them written down. Everybody knows it, but they don't have them written down. The, the man's name is Ed Ruprecht, and he's here with his wife. Well, friends, let's welcome them back to the States from Nigeria. Ed and Wilma, we're, we're so glad and honored you're here with us today. What a blessing to partner with you. You've got a story to tell, and you've got a God who has given you his plan and his uh, direction, and it wasn't your plan. Not at all. Not at all. Um, we had done that already. We had been to Nigeria, served 18 years in a translation ministry back in the 60s, 70s, came back early 80s. Uh, part of that was a New Testament that was translated for the Kukeli people. I was part of the educational process, helping the people to read a new language. They had never read their language before. It had never been written before. So we developed the literacy materials for them. The Bible was given to them in the early 80s. The church just, just burst forth as the Holy Spirit worked in people's lives. And, and, and just thousands of people came to Christ during that time and filled the churches. Uh, 
we felt our work was completed. And we handed the ministry over to the church, the various things we had been involved in, and we came home to minister here in the Northern Illinois District for a bunch of years. Uh, about six years ago, seven, um, it was in the spring, God started putting people into our lives, friends, pastors, teachers, missionaries, but there was a recurring theme that they kept saying, you need to be on the mission field. You need to be on the mission field. Wilma and I were thinking of retiring. I was getting close to 65 then and thinking that, you know, we've done that already. We, and, and this is where I guess I resemble Naaman, you know, because finally we had to say, God, if you can use us, you've got to open the doors because this is, we're, we're, we're not able to do that. We could not believe. We thought we were on a whirlwind. God just took us to Nigeria within in a record time. We were, God raised up uh, prayers, uh, <coughs> partners and supporters and financial supporters at LBT. We, we raised the funds for our ministry. You have been part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but God took us to Nigeria in record time. We barely got there. We had a terrible car accident nearly were killed in that. Three other people died in the other vehicle. But it was a God, the vehicle God gave us with just exactly the right amount of money to buy that vehicle, and that's the vehicle that saved us. After we left and came and recovered and went to the villages and so on, friends of ours looked us in the eye and said, you know, God saved your life for a purpose. He has a plan for you. And very frankly, I wasn't at all sure about that at, that at that time. I knew God took us to Nigeria. That was obvious because we were there. But all these other things happening were just a little bit beyond me. One of the dilemmas that we faced as we went to Nigeria, and the reason we went, was that we were to work with three languages, the Kukeli language, uh, Yala, and Boki languages. Um, the dilemma was that once the scriptures was translated and given to people, we thought that was enough. That just the, the power of the gospel and the, the, the dynamism of, of the message inside would just simply compel people to get into that word and want to read it. It didn't happen. While the Holy Spirit certainly led people to, to, to faith through that message, the Bible never became an open book in the homes of people. And the whole use of the vernacular diminished. And where people and pastors had been preaching in the vernacular, they started preaching in English, the prestigious language and, and the language that, that gave prestige to the indi individual and, and being able to use an interpreter, that's a power kind of a thing. But because of this message was not being communicated very effectively, it was to this, that we were invited to return, to work with those three languages, to help revalue the scriptures again. So people would use the word and they would themselves read the dynamism and, and be compelled by the spirit as they, they were led into the word. We were doing this in several languages, but then God again came into our lives and just moved things in a new direction. It was uh, early in December, we were uh, attending a worship service in a small uh, congregation, which on this particular day was being brought into the Lutheran Church of Nigeria as a full congregation. It had, been, it had the status of a preaching station. Now it was going to be a full congregation. The president of the Lutheran Church was there, and many dignitaries were there. The place was packed out, and, 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 and the, the, the pastors were at their best because I know that because we were there four hours during that worship service. They were doing good. Uh, a lot of things happened uh, as well, but it was a powerful, powerful service. At the end of the service, the various guests were being introduced, and um, we also were introduced um, just by name and so on, where we were and so on. And, but another person also was introduced that was very important, the, the uh, Buturu of the area. He is the, the clan head, the chief. He is the one who had given the land for that particular congregation. And so he was being introduced, and at the end of the service, he came up to us, to Wilma and myself, and he said, 
I want you to appear at my palace today. It was about that blunt. When you are invited to the chief's palace, that's, that's not a if you have time or if you like to. This is a summons. And we were very curious what this was all about. We didn't know the man. And I didn't think he knew us. So a few hours later, we were there. During that time, he had gathered together several other chiefs, other leaders from the community, uh, religious leaders, educational leaders. So quite a group of people was already there. And um, we were really rather mystified as to why we were there. He didn't waste any time. He looked at us directly, and he said, some years ago, a missionary had been assigned to us, had been given to us to translate the scriptures. Due to some unforeseen difficulties in the, in the community and the congregation there, he was forced to leave. Our translation was never completed. We want you to finish our Bible translation. Um, when's the last time you were asked to do a Bible translation? <laughs> Me either. Um, so Wilma says that I was actually speechless uh, for a time, and that doesn't happen real often. But God, she says, never. <laughs> but we were compelled to listen, and even though we were telling the chief that's not why we were here, he was absolutely insistent that we would meet soon. And shortly after Christmas, no longer than two weeks later, we were back and we worked with him and the community to develop their own resources, their own leadership to bring the scriptures to this people group. But God didn't stop there. God kept nudging us and telling us new things. A couple months later, I was involved in a scripture engagement, scripture use workshop, because again, we were trying to help people understand the value of this Bible. And so we were in the Boki language area, and uh, we're in a several days workshop and just having a great time at it. But a delegation from the Ajagam language group came with a letter. The letter simply said, we want you to do our Bible translation for us. We didn't advertise our being there. I don't know how they found us, and they didn't, didn't know why or how they knew that we were part of a, a group that translated Bibles, Lutheran Bible translators. The next day, we had gone home, having breakfast, just finished. A motorcycle pulls up. Another delegation from the Ekajuk language group was there with the same appeal. Come, translate our Bible. And Wilma and I kind of looked at ourselves afterwards and said, is, is there a neon sign out there? Translations here? You know, we, we were absolutely amazed that people knew that we were there and involved in translation process. Our response was this. We messaged back to the home office saying there's a huge need for translations. Help! Help. Nigeria is the most populated country in Africa, about 150 million people. It has over 520 languages. In the Agoja area where we were living, an area of about 100 miles square, over 40 languages. Of those, only one had the whole Bible, and five had New Testaments. The Lutheran Church uh, Missouri Synod had been involved in three of those translations back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And so we knew the need was very, very great indeed. Our response was, let us do language sur surveys so that we can find out how many languages really do need and would be able to qualify for translation projects because it was a very complicated process. We needed to determine resources available, the very need that was available. Can the people actually, uh, do, do they speak another language well enough so they could get the scriptures from a second language? 
So all this survey material was something we engaged in. We came up with about 12 languages that would qualify. And so starting this next month, uh, a new project is going to uh, start off. It's called the uh, Loop Partnership, in which 12 language groups will come together in workshop settings twice a year. Each language will be assigned a consultant. And over a course of three years, they're going to come up with some kind of an analysis of their language, grammatical analysis, phonological analysis. That helps you develop a, an orthography, an alphabet. And then they're also going to translate the Gospel of Luke. We could go on with many stories, but I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> and I am impressed by the flags. And I see the Nigerian flag there. I'm impressed by the ministry that you as a congregation engage in. And obviously, you have responded to the call, here am I, send me. But the work is not done. The work remains humongous, if that's an English word, even in Nigeria alone. May God use you powerfully to affect his will so that the peoples of the world will come to know the good news of Jesus. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you for being partners with us. Thank well, you. Before you get going, uh, I got a quick, how many people, you talked about 150 million people, how many people don't have the word of God in their own language in Nigeria? Okay, um, Nigeria, with the 520 languages, about 60 of them have the New Testaments, 15 have the Old Testament. I have the entire Bible. So only what that, uh, it's what, 90 people are not, um, no, 80 some languages okay. have the scriptures. That still leaves over 400. But I'm thinking that 300 are going to need the scriptures. And that, is that half the country? Uh, that would be most of the country because the larger wow. languages have already been translated, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, and all those. So these would be smaller languages that, that still are without. But still the heart language of people that they have to know and understand. Exactly. English is not the answer. A second language is not the answer. Uh, I, have, I have examined people and, and, and tested them to determine what their understanding of, of the Bible is. On the basis of their English understanding, it's very poor. Well, even among evangelists and lay preachers. And, I, and I'm glad that the difference, you know, in, in a translation from English, like, like the end of the Gospel of Matthew that says, go ye therefore and, and teach all nations, that, that, that with that, with, with English, it sounds like all y'all go. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and, then, and you know what happens when everybody's got the responsibility? Nobody's nobody got goes. the, right. nobody goes. Right. But, but in, in the language that you translated, it's, it's different. Let me just share that with you very quickly. Matthew 28 from Ukele, verses, uh, verse 19 and 20. Amionka balorok pele lihen, lihen. Nangye beba chekal balorok hachanam. Anangye be baptism kalekola di de la wan, la kuying alam alam. The verbal construction here is what we call an individuative. It doesn't include everyone, it speaks to each one individually. So the first word here is the word go, but it really is each one of you go. It speaks to me, it speaks to you individually. Each one of you go to all the peoples, to all the peoples, it's reduplicated. Each one of you do whatever is necessary so that these people will become my followers or my disciples. Each one of you do whatever is necessary so that they will be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of the Creator God. That is a powerful message, and it's that message that I responded to, that my wife and I responded yeah. to when we um, decided to retire <clears throat> and go to Nigeria. So we're, we're saying this retirement very carefully this time around, because we're thinking maybe God has out of Mongolia in mind or something. Yeah, and we, you <laughs> never know. New and language you know group. And you know something? We're ready. Yeah. We're ready. Well, God's richest blessings to you. Let's give thanks to God for it. Thank you. And, and you can meet the Ruprex and lots of other folks out in our narthex. We have a, a number of different organizations where you can find something for you to do, for you to align yourself with the plan of God, because God's plan is this, that all people come to know him as Savior and friend, first you, and then you shining out 
is his light to somebody else. 